this presentation, like I said, it's not a super nitty gritty granular, here's what you need to do to go into aquaculture. Um, what I'm hoping that you can really take away from this presentation um, is a little bit more um, kind of high level, if you will, big picture um, opportunities and different paths that are available um, in aquaculture. Um, as I alluded to a little bit yesterday, um, I am not an expert in aquaculture. My tradition, you know, my, my training, um, my academic background is not in aquaculture. It is in coastal marine ecology and fishery science. So it is related. It is still uh, ocean and aquatic focused. Um, so, the, and, and I also wanted to touch a little bit on kind of some emerging opportunities um, and some issues. There'll be a little bit of repetition from Charlie's presentation yesterday, but it's important information um, that I think is worth repeating. Um, so you'll, you'll hopefully start to get a little bit of an idea of some of these kind of bigger picture questions and maybe things you can bring into your teaching as well, thinking about um, some other related ocean science and, and ag issues. So I wanted to start out by talking about how I actually got to have docs and working in aquaculture. Um, this is me and that is my mother. <laughs> we are, uh, this picture was taken um, in Key West. Uh, we were diving on the, the Vandenberg um, in, I believe it was 2013 or 2014. Um, but I grew up in New Jersey um, doing a lot of this <laughs> with my mother. Um, she is still a scuba instructor. She actually got certified as, as an instructor the year I was born. Um, and we have spent a lot of time underwater together. And so um, spending Really my whole life underwater, on the water, around water. Um, of course, I feel a deep connection to the coast and the ocean, but I've also seen um, people uh, like my mother using the ocean and the coast for their livelihood for my whole life. So I have a very, very deep respect um, for people who uh, do that, who, who are, you know, they're, they're working um, in, in ocean ecosystems and they're relying on natural resources for their livelihood. So uh, for undergrad, um, because of my, I, I knew pretty, pretty early on that I really wanted to, to stay in marine science. Um, my love of the ocean was uh, very strong from a young age. So I, I went to uh, Stony Brook University, their School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences, and I got my bachelor's in marine biology in 2008. Um, I then went to uh, Northeastern University for my master's in marine biology. I graduated in 2010, um, and this is their three C's program. Um, so they consider it a non-traditional science master's. Um, whatever that means, I have a master's degree, and I will argue with anybody who tells me otherwise. Um, but this was a really great program. Each semester is in a different location. So I spent a semester in Massachusetts, a semester in Tahiti, um, more specifically Morea, and a semester um, on Catalina Island, and I got to experience all of those different ecosystems. It was also great for me because I was not quite sure what I wanted to do uh, in marine science for a master's degree. So that was really um, a fantastic experience. Um, I then moved on to Brown University, um, where I ran a large scale um, coastal ecology program um, for about two and a half years. I worked with Dr. Heather Leslie um, she's now the director of the Darling Marine Center at the University of Maine. Um, and I did a lot of this for two and a half years. Um, I would not recommend going to Maine in the middle of January to try to do field work. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and, and when I was working at Brown, um, I started to work a lot more on questions of human and environment interactions and thinking about how people impact the environment and how the environment impacts people. We, we live in natural systems and that is really important for, for how we live our lives, especially people, again, who depend on the ocean for their livelihood, right? Um, and so uh, that is what led me um, to come down to Florida um, in 2013 um, to pursue my PhD in green science. Um, I graduated um, from there in 2018. Um, and while I was at USF, just, I'm not sure which way across the bay, but straight across the bay um, in St. Pete, that way, Eric is saying that way, um, straight in, uh, at the College of Marine Science there, um, I worked on uh, fishery science and management issues. 
Um, specifically, my dissertation was focused on the impacts of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill on commercial fishermen. Um, so again, thinking about that human environment interaction, um, and this is just, um, this is cutting open the head of a red snapper to get out an otolith. So an otolith is the ear bone um, that uh, fish, it's essentially their balance mechanism. It's like our inner ear. Um, and when you take the otolith out of a, a fish, you can look at it, uh, there's growth rings, just like tree rings, and you can age a fish. Yeah, very, very cool stuff. Um, and so we were collecting samples here for some of the ongoing research on um, impacts of Deepwater Horizon um, on, on fish um, biology there. Is that a saw? That is a hacksaw. Oh, yeah. You stick your fingers in its eyeballs and you go. Yep. Yeah, we, we use yep. that hammer. <laughs> yep. So it's, uh, yeah, we had some other samples there too. That's, uh, I think that's a gallbladder or liver or something there. Um, and the other really um, transformative for me part of my, my PhD was, was moving um, from, you know, kind of being on the water um, to being, uh, well, this is quite literally in the halls of Congress. Um, so I uh, worked um, a lot in my time as a, as a grad student on science policy issues and thinking about um, the connections. Again, it's all about the connections between people and the environment for me here, but at a, at a policy level. Um, so I had a couple different experiences um, where I had the opportunity to go to Capitol Hill with other students um, and um, speak with um, Congress people and their staff about different um, ocean science, ocean policy related issues. Um, these experiences were really, really transformative for me um, and, and really, I think, helped me focus on what I wanted to do long term career wise. Um, I kind of joke that I've gone from under the, I keep going progressively up the shoreline in my career. So I started, the first picture I showed you was uh, me scuba diving. And here we are um, in, in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, and so my experiences here um, led me to um, a science policy fellowship with the National Academies of Science Gulf Research Program. Um, and FDAX um, was, my, was my host office. Um, for that experience. So I spent a year with um, not just the Division of Aquaculture, um, but working on projects across the department. Um, and then I was lucky enough that the timing worked out um, that, that the um, position I'm in now came available toward the end of my fellowship. Um, so that has been my trajectory. It is not a straight shot, as I'm sure many of you have, have similar stories, um, you know, in your, in your career path, it's never a straight shot, and sometimes not what you expect. Um, so to, to transition now um, kind of from my story big picture to thinking about um, aquaculture career opportunities, there is a wide range. And I'm sure that you, know, you, some, you already know this um, and, and hopefully you're getting a, a good picture of this as well with the different folks who are presenting um, in this workshop. Um, but really it's you know, everything from a commercial farmer to someone who thinks about policy big picture, right? Someone who works for a state agency, a federal agency, um, folks like, like Courtney, you know, working at a university, extension agents. Um, so there's a lot of different opportunities um, for folks to work in, in aquaculture. Take a sip of water here while you bruise this slide. And as was, was mentioned yesterday, and this is the information I wanted to reiterate because it is important, um, aquaculture is rapidly growing um, to, again, feed a growing global population and meet uh, the seafood supply shortage and, and meet the, the protein demands of a growing uh, human population. So there is projected to be about 10 billion people on the planet by 2050. So that's 2 billion more people in the next 30 years. Wow. Yeah, that's hard to really kind of wrap your brain around, right? Um, that, by some estimates, will require about 220 billion pounds more, so more than we currently produce lean protein, to feed that global population. Okay. So as, as we've kind of already touched on, right, that, that protein demand, that is not going to come from a lot of the traditional kind of protein sources we have now. We just don't 
There's just not enough land on the planet. There's just not enough water. Um, so we really need to think about um, more sustainable ways um, to provide protein to a growing population. Um, and of course, domestic food security, as was mentioned, right? COVID, supply chain shortages um, really, really hammered that home. Um, and food security for nutritionally vulnerable communities globally is another really important point. So thinking outside of just the United States, um, there are a lot of places in the world where seafood um, is the primary protein source, um, and it really can help um, these communities that can't, you know, pork is expensive, beef is expensive, chicken is expensive. Um, not to say that seafood isn't expensive, but um, it, it's often a um, more accessible uh, source of protein in a lot of places in the world. And it's nutritionally very good. And then on the conservation side, of course, um, there's the unsustainability um, of wild harvest overfishing. Um, many of our global fish stocks are still at unsustainable levels. Um, the United States um, does a, a really good job of managing uh, commercial fisheries, as does um, you know, the UK and other European nations. But globally, um, fish stocks are still at unsustainable levels. Um, and I think it is really important to take kind of that global perspective. Right, um, thinking about how many more people are going to be on the planet <laughs> potentially in the next thirty years, we really have to take that broader global perspective. Um, you know, it's not just here where there's more wildfires. It's not just here where our precipitation patterns are changing. It's not just here where roads are melting <laughs> because the temperature is so hot. Um, you know, our infrastructure can't handle it. So, we really need to think about that bigger picture. Um, and global catch potential um, is projected to continue declining. Um, so not only are we at unsustainable levels for a lot of these stocks, um, that, that catch will continue to decline. So again, aquaculture can um, supplement these wild capture fisheries and, and also um, help with conservation. This figure um, you saw uh, yesterday in Charlie's presentation, I'm gonna hammer it home again, and also for some of the folks on Zoom who might not have been here yesterday. Um, so this is the figure from, again, the, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, um, just showing uh, the change in production over time. So in 1950, 97% of fish were caught from the ocean. So the capture production here in the, in the orange bar. And uh, really wild harvest, again, started to, to level out um, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and really has not increased for 30 years. Global, global production of seafood from wild harvest has been steady, and aquaculture has really uh, increased uh, pretty much exponentially to uh, make up that difference, right? So nearly 50 times, um, it's grown nearly 50 times in 30 years and is now over half of uh, all global production of seafood. About 3 billion people today rely on seafood, um, either wild or farmed, for their primary protein source. Again, really thinking about that global perspective. Um, and 60 million people worldwide are directly employed in fisheries and aquaculture. That's direct employment. That's not even thinking about these kind of indirect, uh, you know, you, you, a boat, you're a boat manufacturer or, um, you know, you, you sell supplies that, um, you know, the, the fisher people in your community are going to need. So this is really direct employment. Um, and those economic benefits really um, do spill out um, regionally. Florida shellfish aquaculture contributed um, based on this study by um, Boda et al., um, actually based here at UF, um, 434 total jobs, over $11 million in labor income, um, and over $29 uh, million in sales revenue in 2018. Um, the asterisk there is because this was survey data. Um, and we know that there are a lot of issues with self-reporting, survey response rates, um, what have you. So we know that this is really an underestimation um, of the value of just shellfish aquaculture. So this isn't even the whole industry. Um, so again, I would encourage you to look at that industry overview that's in your binder that, that we've put together. This asterisk, this is survey data and likely underreported is in there as well. Um, but we have done some, um, we've done some calculations based on our own internal certification information. We know how many folks are certified in the state that, that the USDA survey data 
Um, it's, a, it's about maybe about a 30% response rate overall for our industry. You can't really extrapolate, you know, just 30% to, in, you know, there's, all, of course, always caveats in data, but just to give you an idea um, that, that it's definitely an underrepresentation. So to, to hit a little bit more on the potential for aquaculture to be used for conservation and climate change mitigation. And I think this is really um, a really neat kind of emerging field of um, research and, and science and opportunity and kind of that intersection of uh, farming and conservation and, and business management. And um, it's, it's just, it's all around. It's just really cool um, to, to think about. Um, so when you have shellfish farm in the water, for example, shellfish are filter feeders. So what does that mean? They clean the water, right. Um, and they clean the water, including capturing uh, nutrients and carbon, but also not just shellfish, but also seaweed, right? As they grow, they uptake carbon, they need carbon to grow. Um, and this can, and by cleaning the water, they can also, they can, um, the shellfish and the seaweed, they can mitigate nutrient pollution. By nutrient pollution, this is things like, you're near a, <coughs> I don't know, a golf course, or I don't know, you have a lot of septic systems, or people are fertilizing their lawn and it's raining, what have you. Um, so they can mit help mitigate nutrient pollution, um, and so therefore improve water quality, um, and reduce dead zones. Um, so dead zones, um, I don't want to assume that everybody in the room knows what a dead zone is. Does somebody want to explain what a dead zone is? Anybody? Yes. Take a stab at it. I'll take a stab at it. I'll take a stab at it. I'll take a stab at it. Wow, that was fantastic. Yes, absolutely. I'm just gonna come up here and get that. Is do you want the point? Yeah, no, that was great. So just and, and to reiterate for the folks and suit, yes, so it's it's um an overabundance of nutrients causes a, a, a algae bloom, and as they decompose, they use oxygen. Yeah, and they take up all the oxygen, which then Right? It, it kills the fish, it kills the crustaceans, it kills the plants living in the area, anything that can't physically move away, right? It creates these dead zones. Um, and it's a, it's a really big problem, especially here in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, there are large seasonal dead zones um, with a lot of nutrients that come um, from, the, from the Mississippi River. Um, and of course, you know, seaweed, because they do take up um, carbon um, from the water, they can potentially reduce uh, localized ocean acidification impacts. Um, so, which is, which is again, a really important um, climate change uh, impact and, and really important um, for, for the health of the water. Ocean acidification also, um, you know, it, it reduces the ability of anything with a, with a calcium carbonate shell, like a clam, uh, to form that shell. So, uh, mussels, oysters, what have you. So, um, it, it's really important um, from that perspective as well. Coral reefs, ocean acidification, not great for them either. There's also the potential for aquaculture to be used for um, habitat restoration. So this is a this is very similar. There's there's clearly a lot of overlap here, but again, improved water quality, um, rebuilding oyster reefs, um, both you know indirectly and directly. So for example, um, you know FDAX um, just changed our rules to allow for restoration aquaculture. So this is the intentional rebuilding of oyster reefs, but also potentially just by improving water quality, right? You might be able to um, improve the, the natural ability of those wild reefs to repopulate. Regrowth of seagrass beds. So there's some really um, cool science that shows um, seagrass beds are um, can be healthier and, and kind of return to some of the areas where um, shellfish farming is happening because they are 
um, filtering the water and improving water quality. Um, and then of course you just have habitat and refuge for other animals, um, fish, crustaceans, and, and invertebrates. Um, so, you know, if you see in this, oh, actually I should use the, this too for the folks on Zoom. Um, you know, um, if you look here, there's, there's structure in the water there, right? Um, there's um, both, both vertical um, and horizontal structure, um, which is great for um, you know, juvenile fish to live in um, and, and other animals to live in, which can actually help with um, fisheries management so, um, and, and population um, you know, management of these different fisheries. So there are a lot of different potential benefits here. And, and nutrient and carbon capture, which, which I already touched on. Oh, wait, I'm going backwards. Sorry about that. <laughs> go the other way. There we go. Um, so another, another really um, neat thing to think about um, with aquaculture is um, marketing and production technology. So again, this is a lot of, this is engineering that's way over my head and beyond me. Um, but it's really, it's really cool to think about um, how different aquaculture products can really be used, um, not just for food, but even beyond food. So of course we have, you know, food, you know, you got um, uh, seaweed salad, right? Um, but also uh, seaweed can be used in animal feeds. Um, so this comes back a little bit to the conversation we were having yesterday about, um, uh, feed, um, you know, feeding fish. Um, but also other, uh, you know, potential um, livestock or animals. Um, biofuels and bioplastics are another um, emerging um, production technology for seaweed. Um, the, the two examples I have here, these are straws, um, as well as this, this bag that's holding this pasta. They are both made from seaweed. Um, so they are not petrochemical based plastics. Um, and then, of course, pharmaceuticals and cosmetics. Um, seaweed is already used for pharmaceuticals and cosmetics, um, but uh, there, there's, you know, the production can be um, enhanced, especially if seaweed, domestic seaweed aquaculture um, is, is uh, you know, grows its um, uh, source um, that's, that's easier than, you know, importing it. So we also have, of course, marine food fish. Um, I will say too, I'm presenting this, but if you have specific food fish production questions, <laughs> I will direct them elsewhere. Yes, to our, our two folks in the back. Um, but I wanted to give you just two quick examples. Um, so there's um, both land-based and possible offshore production. Um, so we talked a little bit about offshore production yesterday, and I'll, I'll touch on that briefly again, just to give you some quick examples. So um, I, I pulled these photos from Moat Marine Lab. Um, this is their, um, you know, they're, they're growing pompano here. I think this is a, a little bit of an older picture, but I, I found a, it's actually a presentation to or with the FDAX Division of Aquaculture before my time. Um, but this is one of their um, land-based production facilities at the, um, their aquaculture uh, facility in, in Sarasota. So, you know, pompano is one option, for example, um, for marine food fish. And then um, Almaco Jack is another um, potential just example. And this is the, um, specifically the, it's not Compachi Farms anymore. It's now Ocean Era. Um, this is, um, their experimental, um, system that they are working on, um, putting out in, into the Gulf, um, off the coast of, of Sarasota, 45 or 50 miles, um, off the coast of Sarasota. Their, their plan is to, um, grow Emma Kojak. Um, and this, again, this is this big, I keep getting the wrong button. My apologies. Um, this is that um, the bigger uh, net pen type uh, configuration that, that we talked a little bit about yesterday. Marine ornamentals, um, when we think about production technologies. So they are really important for conservation of wild populations and coral reefs um, and new production and husbandry technologies to develop ways to, to um, aquaculture, um, you know, uh, ornamental aquaculture for um, hobbyists uh, is really important. Um, a lot of uh, trade for um, ornamental species uh, elsewhere in the world is pretty environmentally destructive. Um, so it, it's really important um, to think about um, the conservation implications here. And again, if you have specific ornamental production questions, I will refer you to other people that work in this building. <laughs> um, and I wanted to, so this is the, um, 
This is the broader impacts deeper thinking portion of the presentation that I'm going to throw out. Um, I, I, I picked this picture in particular for, for this uh, thing about conservation of wild populations and coral reefs. Does anybody want to take a stab as to why not Katrina? Have we heard from you, Erin? Erin. I'm just really excited I'm remembering names. That's Nemo and Dory. That's right. That's Nemo and Dory. And they... No, please. Just after that movie came out, there was a big push people on the in home aquarium, which mm -hmm. led to kind of developing lots of people from different groups. Yes. Good. Yes, exactly. So um, just I'm going to reiterate for the folks on Zoom. So um, the the Disney movies, Nemo and Dory, um, increasing uh, the desire for these fish. Um, now I will say I'm going to get into. There's other people in the room who I welcome and an active and lively discussion about this, if you would like. Um, and Katrina and I, yes. So actually, and I will say too. So Katrina and I went back and forth on this a little bit too. So um, I'm not an aquaculture expert. I don't work in uh, ornamental aquaculture. Um, and I thought, hmm, I'm going to pull up, let me pull up some statistics on increases in purchases of these species after these movies. Do you know where I'm going with this? I see the look on your face back there, Eric. Okay. So, oh, wait, I had this little, I had this guy. Okay. Yes. So this is the, I wanted to pull this in. So this is our uh, Nemo and Dory. Um, so I wanted to I wanted to try to pull some statistics on increases and in, in the um, imports or sales. And instead, what I found was several papers that said there were no increases mm. in sales. There was a lot of increase in online traffic searching for how to how do I I want one for my home aquarium. My kid wants one for their, my home aquarium. But there was no correlation with actual increased imports. Now, I think we mentioned yesterday, I think Charlie mentioned in his presentation that aquaculture data, especially what I what I found, especially when we think about imports of ornamental uh, fish, are, we'll say, lacking. <laughs> um, and marine ornamental fish are also generally not their their import their trade is not tracked because they are not listed on the endangered species list they are not threatened or endangered and so the data is really poor um so i wanted to i wanted to bring this up for two reasons one i don't work in this field and so what i want to find information that wasn't um a popular magazine article i wanted to really find some data and find some research and several articles said we actually didn't see this. However, asterisk, asterisk, the data is not great. Um, these two articles, I think, would be really great um, for you to read and even uh, give to your students to reference. Um, and we, we will, um, the links will be on the teacher resource links page. One of these actually features our very own uh, Mr. Eric Cassiano back there. Um, and this other outside magazine, um, article uh, uh, Katrina recommended to me. Um, but I also wanted to mention this because I think it's really important if you wanted to, especially maybe some of your upper level students, think about this kind of discussion, right? Thinking about how do we have these kinds of conversations about conservation and data and bigger picture thinking and critical thinking and all of that. Because like I said, Katrina and I had a back and forth about this, right? Um, and we are both trained scientists and we, we generally come from the same place on this, but we took a little bit of a different perspective. Um, and all of this is to say too, like data is really important. We need to have better information on all of this. Um, and an interesting point, you know, a lot of, a lot of some of the literature I read thinking about this and presenting this is really about, we need to be careful about how we talk about conservation implications of things, right? Could it actually be more hurtful to conservation, to uh, the research and the production of these species, could it be more hurtful um, to those efforts to just kind of, I don't want to say jump on the bandwagon, but jump on the bandwagon of a narrative of everybody rushed out to buy a fish. And it's really hard to keep these kinds of species in captivity, right? This isn't a goldfish and it's like, whatever, my kid won a goldfish at the carnival and it's going to die in a week and whatever, right? There's a lot of high investment there. Um, so on that, if there's anybody else that actually 
has more expertise on this that wants to either contribute now or later in the discussion, I would love to uh, broach that. Or maybe if you want to bring it up when we're not recording on Zoom, we can do that. Too. <laughs> um, so is there an increase in the number of well, since the email came out? So in and I I had it I like I pulled a couple. Being, I, don't, I don't know. If it's for it's, it's anecdotally. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So anecdotally, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the productions have. Well, no, uh, yeah, yeah. 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 And again, it's all anecdotal for people in the industry. It's like, so when Nemo hit, it's like, hey, whatever. But uh, clownfish were also increasing in popularity before. And then there was this kind of like, oh, hey, they're cute, blah, 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 blah. And then we put them at the forefront with Finding Nemo. Um, the, the concern was when Finding Dory came out, um, like Eric just said, these are not aquacultured species. So it was, well, what if we have another Finding Nemo? Because mm -hmm. all of these, all blue tangs are wild capture. All of them. They're not an aquaculture species. So any anything like that you put in your aquarium comes from wild capture. So there was this concern from the industry and from a conservation perspective of like, well, we need to figure this out. And that's where people like. Our that funding right. agencies made us do this. Yeah, you guys right. stepped in. So right here, they beat me by two weeks. Oh, oh man. Really cool. So we were both working on the same thing. Hey guys, was really so, yeah. Two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. 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 And so that was really, yeah, that was that was the concern. Um, the concern would be this increase in demand and people want to buy these species and they're captured on wild reefs. And like I mentioned, very environmentally destructive, right? Using cyanide, using dynamite um, to capture these fish. Um, and again, the oh, if you're not familiar with like oh, yeah. wild reef fish capture in certain mm -hmm. areas, it is not in a, the United States, it's not that bad. Is that that bad? And so, and a lot of the, it, it, it's it the majority, the, US, the majority right? of imports come from, um, it, yeah, the majority of imports, um, you know, of these very charismatic reef species, they're coming from the, um, you know, the Pacific Triangle and in Southeast Asia. So, um, and again, the, the, the data, the import data is really poor because they're not regulated as a threatened or endangered species. So they're, they're really not tracking um, when they come into the U.S. The, the data is just not great. There are folks who certainly are trying to get a better handle mm -hmm. on the data and improve how it's how it's collected and, and analyzed. So and also collection methods and collection methods. Correct. So um, oh, yes. Yes, so please. I'm not sure about whether or not demand did actually increase because the data is not there. But from what you guys said, did we see an increase in funding to breed these in aquaculture? Like, was there a, a surge in interest in the aquaculture industry with this news coming out because of the concern? Like, was more funding looked into? So, so we, we knew how to raise clownfish when the came out. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I would assume it would have increased sales. But like I mentioned yesterday, like the that particular perfectly marked one all of a sudden wasn't what the markets wanted. Mm -hmm. And so this. The, the, the strange color morphs is what they start to purchase more of. So I don't know how much of it was due to the movie or whatever. But right. Yeah, I mean, so for the thing, my thought is, just to get back to it, my thought was always that it was not tied to the movie. There was already a trend in the red Primarily the movie. So that was already happening. Is anybody talking about the Disney? Find out. So the worry was the conservation organizations rising tribe that we work for in our London from. And that was their concern. And so we had a timeline to figure out how to raise it so the producers would be ready to do this when the movie comes out. And we knew it was coming out. We had like one and a half years to get this done. So we, we took on this task and we, we accomplished it. Yeah, but it, we did it, but it wasn't commercialized until it's just sort of a disassociative way for the entire like we have a clientele that produces there's conservation issues associated with it. Fantastic. Yeah. 
essentially pay to do that. So did you know that if you said we're in production, so you of the movie, so you knew a year yes. before? We knew we knew well before the movie was coming out that it was coming out. Now. Of finding Dory or finding me? Dory. Dory. So yes. you had the realization, I guess, after finding Nemo. Of the soon increase in sales, exactly. which we don't really okay. know if it was to do with the movie, if it was due to just an increase in demand. Mm -hmm. um, because I think it's a legitimate like, concern, though, yeah, considering they're 100% wild capture. Yeah, that's I think that was the concern that, Correct. you know, if, even if there is a little uptick, uptick, it's all still coming from wild capture. And I think I think that was more of the concern, which I mean, like Eric said, if there's a conservation attachment to the demand from the industry, couldn't hurt Fran. I mean, the the less we can take from the wild and produce in captivity, I mean, it's the better. And you all see a lot of glory when you come back here and do it later. Yeah, and so <laughs> I I would encourage you to to read um, both of these articles. They're quick reads. I mean, like I said, they would even be appropriate if you wanted to, to print them out and, and use them for your um, for your students as a discussion point. Again, this is kind of bigger picture, some, some deeper questions. Um, and some of the other references um, from the academic literature that I, that I pulled on these and thinking about data. So they found specifically increases in Google searches, huge surges on Google about, you know, both, both after Nemo and Dory came out. But the actual follow through on sales was not they didn't they didn't find that that increase but I'll share those as well. Well again big asterisk data right we need to think about the quality of the data. Vince yes would would it would have been appropriate for Disney to come out with a uh, a disclaimer or a notice to parents if you you know towards at, at the end of the like during the credits maybe at the beginning of the credits I'm going to think about that and get back to you. Um I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to make any official statement about what no, you should or should not. Yeah, just, <laughs> you don't have to make it official, but I'm just suggesting that maybe that would have been helpful in stemming the. Can I? I'll think. I'll, I'll think about that and get back to you. Need to be more. Yeah, please don't make a statement. I'll think. I'll think about that. <laughs> yes, Barbara. Um, Back to the whole idea because yesterday one of the presenters was this um, high school teacher downtown who actually is breeding by Nemo or Flounder, you know, based off of the increased population, is my assumption. So now that we're doing this, and that's what her whole aquaculture system down there is for, is clownfish. Do you have any insight? And I'm being serious of a potential other movie or something else coming out in like a year or two of a fish that maybe we may want to start now in our aquaponic system instead of just tilapia or clownfish, you know, like mm -hmm. where's the market going? <laughs> Well, I think, and I think, right, well, aside, what can they sell? It's not making those whale sounds from the moon. What's happening? Continue to tell you what you shouldn't do. What you shouldn't do. 
Yes. Um, just like with the 101 Dalmatian, I mean, we, um, we yep. went to a, a Dalmatian rescue to get a dog. And I mean, and some of those puppies there were from the one of the primary uh, places that provided them for the movie. So even though the data might not suggest that these fish were um, increased, we know for a fact that of course they are. I mean, with the popularity, just like the Dalmatian puppies. And that's why I said to you, I'm gonna to defer to the people yeah. in the room who work on this. Yeah, exactly. So, and I think any interaction, and this point is too in the, like I said, some of the, some of the literature that I read, any interaction, any exposure, any movie, Bambi was another example that was mentioned, right? What effect did, did the movie Bambi have on? There was some evidence that hunting licenses decreased in the years following Bambi coming out, right? Any, any kind of exposure in popular media to any, any resource, right? Any, any charismatic animal could have an impact on how we, we think about that, um, you know, our consumer habits, our patterns, any of that. So again, I just wanted to I'm really glad that I was able to spark a lively discussion. I love that. Um, but thinking about some of these bigger picture questions, right? This is all, all part of it. Um, you know, aquaculture, natural resources, agriculture. Um, these are all really important questions and, and conversations to have. And I think also important to realize too that even people who work in the same industry, in the same division very closely, can have different perspectives on these things and, and think about these questions from different angles. And I think that's really important. Any other thoughts? We apologize to the Zoom people that probably did not hear half of that conversation. No, I think it picks it up. I didn't hear okay. any, I didn't get anybody telling me they couldn't hear. Okay. So I tried to repeat the, the yeah, questions yeah. as best I could. Oh, I gotta click on the screen again. And okay, great. So, um, I want to go through here, um, and I'm, I'm going to run over, I think, a couple of minutes here, but I think we had a really great um, discussion. So some of our goals and challenges, big picture, and this is kind of from a division perspective, but also kind of a bigger aquaculture perspective. Um, so we really need forward-thinking policies. Again, this is kind of my science policy hat. Forward-thinking policies that can enhance production, but also support coastal communities and protect ocean ecosystems. So it really is a balance of livelihoods, ocean, you know, ecosystem protection, um, and thinking about ways that we can really move the industry forward. That's what we do every day in the division, right? That is really our big picture mission. Um, political and social acceptance of aquaculture, misinformation, and NIMBYism, it is a big, big problem. Um, and NIMBY, uh, just again, stands for not in my backyard. Um, and it can be a very small project, or a very large project, it does not matter. Um, there is a lot of nimbyism. Um, and a lot of it just stems from misunderstanding and misinformation, right? And Charlie hinted at our fishy facts, you know, our kind of myth busting um, that we're working on um, in the division. Um, building trust in new relationships and reaching new stakeholders is really important. Um, so we, we think about this a lot, um, you know, and it's, it's also outside of thinking just directly aquaculture, right? We also need to think about um, other people who are living and working um, in these systems, including uh, fishers, right? They're, they're working on the water too, um, thinking about, um, you know, oil and gas interests. They're out there, not as much in Florida as other places in the Gulf. Um, we need to think about, um, you know, the tourism industry. There are just a lot of different factors and a lot of different um, groups we need to think about. Um, competing and confusing authorities. This is a very big one. Um, for aquaculture, um, and it really uh, holds back the potential for aquaculture to develop um, in the United States, um, and that's um, competing and confusing authorities both at the, uh, the local, state, and federal level. It, it really goes um, it's at a multitude of scales. Um, funding and startup investment is really important. Um, it takes a lot of time and a lot of money to um, start and then maintain a commercial scale operation um, as you've um, either experienced on your own or, or I'm hoping, you know, and, and hearing from these presenters, there's always risk. Um, your first attempt may fail and your second and your third and your fourth and your fifth might fail. Um, so what does that look like if you're a commercial scale operation, right? There's a lot of money and risk involved. Yes. So in other uh, agriculture divisions like dairy or beef, there's mm -hmm. a shrinking uh, population 
of, of new farmers and, and le there's less and less farmers. Do you guys see that same thing with aquaculture as bigger and bigger producers come in, but there's smaller and smaller small scale productions? So generational turnover is a big deal. Yes. So there is, um, you know, we, we want to maintain those family farms, right? We want to we want to keep the next generation um, going into aquaculture. And that's part of the reason why we're really invested in these kinds of trainings, right? Because if, if y'all have the information, you, you're excited, you're going into your classroom and you're teaching your students about this, they become really excited to um, work in this field. Um, and they might, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure Rachel can talk to how many of her students in, in Cedar Key, um, you know, are from, are from farming families, but it's, it is really important. So I don't know, I don't have an exact number. Does anybody just think about like so, number of young folks entering aquaculture? Uh, yeah. number of young, I, I have no just think about like generational turnover. The question is kind right, of shrinking. Yeah. I mean, I think well, um, we're still seeing a growth in number of farms, though. Right, like, but I think as far as young people, like new farmers, um, entering the industry, um, I have to, I have to look at. I mean, bigger picture farming generally. I know that getting young people to enter farming and agriculture as a career path and a viable career path is really difficult overall. Right, agriculture is seeing fewer and fewer young, young new farmers, and more and more family farms are not surviving. And I guess it depends on the commodity too. We aren't yep. really seeing those super farms in certain commodities, but like the Atlantic Sapphire would definitely be a version of that. Like it is the, you know, salmon farm in Florida. It's the mm -hmm. only one. It's the, you know the super farm for that. But I mean, for other things like clam farming, I, I, I get it. It just depends on the commodity, really. Right. If there's a bunch of little farms, or if it's all being absorbed. By yeah. One. Yeah. That's a good question. I don't. I don't have enough um, kind of boots on the ground and total experience with that. But where's our inspectors? I hope that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. We'll we'll uh, we'll bring in a plant farmer next time to do a presentation. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, along with the competing and confusing, confusing authorities, is also regulatory burden. Right. There's a lot of regulations. They take a lot of time. They take a lot of money to comply with, um, and um, they can be. Um, Repetitive, redundant is the word. Um, and, and confusing. So um, there's definitely um, you know an effort um, to try to streamline a lot of regulation. Um, and this photo, um, I just wanted to highlight. Um, you know, touching on that misinformation and nimbyism. Um, this is a photo from a meeting, um, a public meeting um, that. Actually, several of us um, in the division attended in Sarasota um, back in January before the world was upside down on its head um, for a hearing on a um, permit for the um, Ocean Era um, farm that I mentioned earlier um, that is still in the process of um, review on that, that permit. I just wanted to put that up there. So again, moving on to, you know, just thinking about two goals, expanding production and markets as we touched on, updating regulations with the best available science so that we can grow the industry and also make sure we're uh, protecting the environment. Research and partnerships, it's always a big one. Um, that's why we're always applying for grant funding <laughs> and trying to do, do more work. K-12 and public education, that's why we're all here in this room. Um, and again, the, the public education on the misinformation piece is a big one. Um, and of course, outreach, communication, and, and industry training. All right. So I just wanted to again end, bookend this, and and say, you know, I hope, I hope this gives you kind of a, it's a, it's really a three thousand foot view of uh, the range of different career opportunities in aquaculture, um, and we'll have that more granular, granular level uh, presentation in the classroom for you. Um, for you, this is more for you, but also a little bit for your students. I wanted to encourage you to explore different opportunities and resources. Um, just by being here in this room, I'm sure that y'all are already doing this, but it never hurts uh, to reiterate. Um, so I wanted to highlight just a couple of groups that um, we work with um, and that we've, we've highlighted a little bit throughout the training. So the Florida Marine Science Educators Association, the Florida Association of Science Teachers, 
If anybody's going in October, Katrina and I will see you there. Um, the, the Centers for Ocean Sciences Education Excellence. Um, I've actually done a couple of trainings with that group. They are, they are really great. They have a lot of two kind of oceanography, marine science related trainings. Florida Ag in the Classroom, National Ag in the Classroom, of course, and then the Florida FFA Association. And I'm not going to read down this whole list because again, all of this will be in your teacher resources document with those links, but different organizations um, that have many, many, many resources, ways for you to plug in experts that you can engage with. Um, and I've got um, Katrina's email there again for the end time that you're seeing um, and our aquaculture educator, educator resources webpage. Um, I would encourage you to look at that. Oh, that page links to a lot of these resources as well. Um, and then for um, either for you or for your students, again, this is more upper level, but I wanted to include this different job boards. I mean, sometimes it just helps to go and see, oh, this job looks interesting. What kind of skills do, would somebody need for this kind of job? What are they looking for? Or you're looking to change career paths, right? Um, there's also a, the USDA has a, a listserv um, that, you know, they just, email out things on occasion, you know, jobs, interesting things of note. So you can just email um, Tim Sullivan there at the USDA. Um, and I also um, wanted to touch on um, these organizations, um, SACNIS, um, the Minority Business Enterprise and Aquaculture, as well as the USDA Beginning Farmers and Ranchers um, program. Um, there's also, um, you know, all of these two, aside from job boards, there's grant opportunities with these a lot as well. There's scholarship opportunities. Um, you, if you have a, a graduating senior, um, you know, looking for uh, an internship, a college scholarship, what have you, um, these would all be really great resources. You're looking to get grant funding to continue a program like this in your school. Um, these would all be really, really great places to look.